Your best is to go from each other, guys. Together, together, together. We have to make sure we nurture and look after the land that we have got set aside for our wildlife. It comes at a cost. And that cost is not going to come just money falling off a tree. It's going to come from the hunter. If we do not get these hunters, Gaji Gaji will collapse completely. This school here wouldn't be there without the hunters. For the local community were decimating them from the wildlife just for the meat. The idea was let's put a value on the animal. It's a way of trying to get the people to understand that if you look after your animals, you will be rewarded with the money that comes from your area. There is a lot of conflict between humans and wildlife, particularly crocodiles, and a lot of people actually lost their lives. challenges are going down because of having the safari operator in our community as a way of human and wildlife control. If the hunters were not here, these mountains would be a flock with poachers. In total, we've put back into the community in excess of a million dollars, which wouldn't have been there had it not been for that. My name is Martinez Cock. I've been a professional here in Zimbabwe for about 18 years now. Started when I left school and uh, worked mainly in the Zambezi Valley. And this is where I prefer to hunt. Hunted around Africa a little bit, Mozambique, Tanzania, Botswana, Zambia. But Zimbabwe is home. My family has always been involved in the safari industry, so I kind of grew up around it. Always been involved with uh, wildlife and conservation. I mainly just do big game, dangerous game, elephant, buffalo, leopard, lion. That's my favorite animals to hunt. I don't do too much plans game anymore. I don't like seeing five, six animals a day being brought in to a skinny shed every day, so I'm not up for that. I like the, the thrill of chasing one animal, looking around and finding the oldest and best. My name is Corris Ferreira, born Zimbabwean. Father was a born Zimbabwean, and my children are born Zimbabwean, so we all from one huge Zimbabwean family. I started in the hunting industry in 1987, just doing outfitting, not as actual professional guiding and decided in 1992 to finalize the actual professional hunting license. So from 92 to now, it gives me 30 years that I've been guiding as a professional. Gachi Gachi, what a beautiful spot. On Lake Kariba, about 75,000 acres of hunting area that's well looked after by Chorus, who's the operator here. The Gachi Gachi campfire area is on the shores of Lake Kariba in the north of Zimbabwe. The area is comprised of floodplain, flatland, and going into the mountain area, which we call Makandi. 
Kariba itself at the moment is pretty low, so our floodplains are in excess of a mile wide in places. And this has also given the positive side of all the grassland, great amount of food for these animals. Animals have always been a passion, from riding a horse to seeing a kudu in the cotton field. And in 93, I got an option to actually get into a campfire operation. Uh, I felt that that was the ultimate contribution back into the wildlife. We could take a piece of ground, which was pretty much uh, destitute, and uh, trying to remold it. And that's what we've managed to do. It's been a great achievement and a great challenge since 1993. So in Zimbabwe you get three types of land. You get private land, you get uh, tribal land, which is a campfire, and you get safari areas. Safari areas are run by the National Parks or the Fish and Game Department. Uh, campfire is run by the, the people and the community that live within the area and the councils, and then private land is run by a private individual, ranchers, conservancies, etc. A campfire actually stands for Communal Area Management Program for Indigenous Resources. It's large tracts of land in Zimbabwe that journey to uh, national parks areas. There was wildlife moving from one national park into the other, and these areas had the potential of looking after wildlife. However, due to no value on the animals, well, the local community were decimating them just for the sake of meat. Uh, the idea was then that let's put a value on the animal, the people on the ground, they must see the benefits that's coming from the wildlife. My name is Tshona Manzungu, the chairperson of Kachigaji Fishers Association. I've got uh, five villages, I've got 175 PIM to holders. Each permit it holds three people, so I'm leading it's 525 people, all in all. My name is Kuzanai Makanyaire, councillor for Gache Gache Wadi 2 and Nyami Nyami Rural District Council. As a councillor, I'm here to link the community with the Nyami Nyami Rural District Council management. If there are some challenges we are facing here as Wadi 2, I'm the one who is linking the community with the government departments at local level. We have three wards falling under the Nyami Nyami Rural District Council. When we do a hunt in a ward, if we shoot, for example, an impala in a ward, the funds and meat will be given to that particular ward. It's a way of trying to get the people to understand that if you look after your animals, you will be rewarded with the money that comes from your area. This incentive has worked tremendously well. It's made sure that everybody joins together to get their chair out of the deal. I would say hunting, it helps the community because you are getting money from what dividend from Collis Ferreira. So hunting, it helps us because if we get that what dividend, we are building our schools, our community, so it helps. We need more hunters here. So if we do not get these hunters, Gajigaja will collapse completely. We won't build our schools, we won't build our roads, our bridges. We won't do all those things because of missing of these people. We don't want to miss them. We need them. The community has some problems with the wildlife. We got some people who died because of hippo attacks and some were died because of uh, elephants uh, attacks. Also, who died because of buffalo's attack. But uh, the challenges 
are going down now because of having the safari operator in, the, in our community as a way of human and wildlife control. We've just had a, a bushfire that's been started by poachers. We cannot afford to have our grass burn off. It's totally different to Makuti where the mountains and the grass is long. This grass here, while it may reshoot, we need the bulk for the animals. What the poachers do is they set the grass on fire, wait for a little short green grass to come up, and then they'll come and hunt that. It's easier for them to control it with their dogs and at night with lights. It is a disaster and it is serious that we have to put this fire out as quickly as possible to try and save the, the food for the wildlife that's in the area. While it's terrible, it's good to see the determination that's coming from these guys that are prepared to put their lives at risk with a fire in order to save the food for the animals. clock we got in here just after 10 and it's when we've beaten out one section fires has been picked up with wind and just turned in a different direction we've now got another vehicle that's come to help us or well, more members of the, of the community have come in from the back so hopefully with all the hands on deck now we might get a handle on it so I look at it like that and I just see food, animals food going burning away. It's even a little bird just trying to escape from the fire. Probably find out a nest here or something. Yeah, the warnings are going out. That's what we're complaining about now as I said if they get hold of the people that set the fires, uh, justice will be given out the way they just did it by putting the fires in the ground.
One of the biggest threats to all areas, particularly these safari areas, is human encroachment. We've had a great increase of people from all around Zimbabwe coming down to come and catch fish. Kuriba has an abundant supply of fish. Fishing is the major industry of this area. A lot of fish. Now, with that money coming in, so have the little stores that have followed and the fish buyers that have come from as far away as Harare and that to come and buy fish. There's a big demand for fish. Tilapia is well sought after. Trapia, yeah. tigers. Yeah. So people they come from Harare, Kariba, wherever they come and buy their fishes straight from the hub. Straight from the hub. They put them in the cooler box and they carry the fishes to Harare. We started here in the beginning with 800 to 1,000 people within the community. Today we're sitting with probably two and a half thousand people in the community. I think between three and ten tons of fish is taken out daily, which is a hell of a lot. We've also got to monitor that because we were worried that with that volume of fish being taken out of the water, it's just a matter of time before that now is depleted and those guys are going to be trying to find something else to fill the day with. Are they going to turn to poaching? So we have to be on our toes 24-7. We start from four inch, four and a half, five inch, five and a half. National parks do not allow three inch, three and a half, two and a half, two inch, they don't allow because it catches small fishes. If you catch small fishes, you are catching a fish from breeding, you kill it. So if you use four inch, we allow it to grow up, then you catch it with four inch. Is it all illegal? What they've done here, this, this area is an illegal area. Uh, it's a full moon. There's been to be no fishing over a full moon. These are all buyers that have come here to come and buy fish from the illegal netters. We've got a problem with fish poaching in this area. Right in front of my camp here, there's a little area here which is one of the breeding zones, which is a restricted area, completely restricted to any netting. Look at the size of all these illegal fish that's been taken out of the water. As was discussed today by the Fishermen's Association Chairman, they use a net which has got a four inch hole, uh, which would mean that you are going to catch a bream in the region of a pound and a bit more. Yet if we look at all these little fish, there's all illegal uh, fish that's being taken out. Before we even get to the next ones, they've already decided, hang on a minute, it's not worth it. So they've already started to destroy the netting that's lying around their houses. They will take out of this place in one night in excess of five tons of bream in a breeding zone. If that continues, it's gone in such a short period of time.
catch are decreasing because of these poachers are using small nets and they are using illegal nets. So they are using monofilaments, whatever they like they use. So they are forcing some of the fishers to remove themselves from fishing because the fish is decreasing and the number of poachers is becoming very high. Those people they are being forced to go and poach animals like impala, buffaloes, you know, because the fish is decreasing. When a fish poacher makes more money in one night than what a cop makes in a month, it's basically impossible to stop it. But we have to continue and we have to try. When I first came to this area, we hardly saw a warthog. Cats were, were not existed. Leopard were not here, lion were not here, the your predators were not here. We built this area up without introduction of in any animals. We now have from the small little rabbit, clip springer, diker, grey spuck, impala, we've got eland, water buck, there's kudu, elephant, buffalo. But what's happened now is because we built those animals up, we've actually now found ourselves increasing the predators that have come in. We've got prides of lion that have moved in. We've got wild dogs that have moved in. We have a number of leopard that have moved in. And a crocodile, geez, tremendous amount of crocodile. Our prime focus on coming to Gachi was for crocodile. There is a lot of conflict between humans and wildlife, particularly crocodiles. There have been a lot of people maimed and mauled and, and a lot of people actually lost their lives to crocodiles here. Crocodile, that gnarly old head big teeth sticking out, literally thousands in this area. I could put a bait out, which we normally use a hippo for on bait, and we could have up to 100 crocodiles around that bait. Majority of the time when you're croc hunting, you, first thing you do is you find sign. You find where they lay up during the day, nice little sunny spots. in. Uh, I've done a lot of spot and stalk where you just walk the bays and uh, find a nice big croc and stalk up and the other way is yeah you bait him, you build your blind and in you go and you just wait for the perfect shot. It's going to tie up some uh, old hippo legs that, from our last safari that's a little bit rotten. I'm going to tie them up. And throw some blood and lung and stuff in the water here. Let's get the croc's attention. And we're going to fix up this blind behind me so that we're good to go and try and shoot a crocodile. The crocodile is the one animal that can sit for three months, four months, waiting for uh, some food. He is the greatest challenge. And the smallest movement, and that big old boy is gone. A lot of challenge to the hunter. A lot of crocs are very shy at first, but you'll get a lot of the young coming in first, start feeding on the bait. And once they start chomping away and rolling in the water and thrashing around, then that builds confidence and you get the bigger fellas coming in. Try and take crocodiles off that are anywhere between 
13 foot and the largest dude we've taken was just on 17. Those crocodiles are all old. They're all in that 60, 70, 80 years of age. They've already stopped their breeding. We've got thousands of crocodile, we're allowed to shoot 10. So the numbers that we take off are small. It's sustainable. And by doing it that way, we know that for the future, those animals will still be here. The crocodile population just exploded. They were there all along. We've just got too many fishermen now, and illegal fishermen at that, taking out the fish. So the crocodiles have got to feed on something. And with all the nets, we're now finding the crocodiles are following these nets as they're being pulled in with the fish inside. Unfortunately, at the end of the net is a far bigger meal than what they've been used to taking out of a little old tilapia inside. We have one small bay. In that area, we've now lost close on 20 men. All of them were poachers, but it's still a human life. It doesn't matter who they were. We have got more than 50 people died. Since I started fishing in 1990 up to now, some they were being beaten by croc, some they were beaten by hippos, and people died on the way to their jobs by elephant, some by um, buffaloes. We uh, built a blind yesterday evening and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go sit in it here before before it gets too hot. I put on my sun hat because we're gonna be sitting in the sun in the middle of the day. And this is an area where the where this big crocodile tends to come out. So we're gonna sit in our blind. We don't have any bait. We're just gonna sit quietly. And uh, now it's a waiting game. So we're we're gonna act a little bit like crocodiles as well be the ambush predators today and just sit quietly and wait and be patient. Just wait. I'm 
Smack right, shoot him. Wait, wait. Two rounds. Load, reload your magazine. I like to see it. Jeez. That is a lot of adrenaline. Oh, oh, oh. that, my friend, is a lot of adrenaline. Tinny, that's a lot of adrenaline. Thanks for being patient. Beautiful. That is a big crocodile. Yeah, that's a big croc. You see how much bigger he was compared to all the rest? Yeah. And there were some big crocs on that island. The first shot, perfect. Yeah. The next two follow-ups are good. When his tail goes like this, that's, that's a good, uh, good sign. That's a proper, that's a spinal shot. I've never shook so much before a first shot in my life. And we've been watching him for a while. He came out ages ago. Just Did been waiting. There when he opened his mouth, that's when I said, okay. Uh, I've never <laughs> shook so much before. I've never had to come off the trigger that many times before a shot. You think you shook then? Wait until you have to get in the boat to go over there and get him. <laughs> Look at this. This is insane. Good. Yeah. <sighs> Just watch him. If you don't feel this, stop hunting. Well done, Tinny. That's one we've been waiting for, boy. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank nice. you for being so patient. Yeah, so uh, it, 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 you see this? The teamwork thing. I mean, I, 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 uh, I just like, if you're not calm, when you pull the trigger, you're going to screw it up. And this is a golf ball. This crocodile wouldn't have made it much longer. He's obviously swallowed something, had a snare or, well, it's a big wire. It wouldn't have decomposed and this crocodile most likely would have starved to death. Again, 
pays into the process. You can see there's so many crocodiles here, but we've taken one out that wouldn't have lived for much longer. Maybe another six, seven months. It's about how long they can go between feeding. And then it would have been a slow and brutal death. This was quick. That animal never heard the shot. We're very happy to have taken this crocodile out of the system. And the money went back where it belongs. Uh, keep trying to continue to keep these areas free of illegal fishing and poaching activities, illegal netting activities, hopefully reducing human-wildlife conflict. My name is Peter Banda, the deputy headmaster in this school, Gacho Gacho Primary School. I've been in this school for the past 25 years. As of today, we have got 487 children. We have got 17 teachers. The school starts from uh, kindergarten up to grade seven, while our secondary sector is on the other end. When I came in this school, I really found out that uh, as the hunters, they are playing a very important role, not only in the life of the school, but in the life of the whole community. The hunters do not come here to slaughter our animals. Actually, they are promoting the management of wildlife and helping to fight the poaching. This school here wouldn't be there without the hunters. As an example, we look at uh, the accommodation you can see there. Some of the schools you go outside, the campfire areas, do not have such houses. Right now, today, we have people still living in poor and dark houses, in the places where there are no hunters. I'm Edson Mahaso, the geography teacher at Gacha Gacha Secondary School. Human-wildlife conflict is a very critical area to be considered here in Gachigachi. The children here, when they're coming to school, uh, the animals are actually within the vicinity. So when they come from home, they meet elephants, they meet buffaloes, they meet hippopotamuses. A lot of animals are here. So when they are coming to school, they are directly involved with these animals. We really have to teach the children how to live together uh, with these animals. Uh, we have got some clubs being supported by the local hunters. In these clubs here, we teach the children how to avoid human wildlife contracts. We learn the importance of these animals. Because you see, something funny. With us Africans, if we see an animal moving there, all we think is, is, is a dish of meat on the table. That is one of the misconceptions we try to eradicate from the children. We teach them the importance of the animals and how we can best live in harmony with the animals. There's no single day that passes without me seeing some elephants there. I'll tell you one thing. Elephants right now have multiplied to an extent that I don't know. We could see one or two elephants per day or per week when I came here in 1998. But right now there are herds and herds of elephants. The same with the buffalo. The animal population is growing. As a community, we sometimes wonder why there is a limitation in the hunting of elephants. And yet we are saying the elephants have multiplied here in Gachi Gachi. Last year, we had an influx of elephants into the area. Yeah. We had well in excess of 100 elephants at times coming in and doing tremendous damage. We tried driving them out with firing rounds at the top of the head. We used firecrackers, threw firecrackers under their feet. Uh, eventually nothing happened and we decided we're going to have to shoot one before somebody gets killed in the area. We came at night, uh, we shot one elephant, we, behind the back of the uh, we shot one elephant probably about 100 yards away. Everybody was happy with that and the next minute the counsellor who we've just been speaking to contacted me and said please can we come and assist him. The elephant 
are in his uh, backyard now. We came around and literally from his house, the elephants are standing in the field that you can see behind us. The other elephant had just been shot 30 minutes prior to that. They were so used to the area, not even a gunshot was going to disturb them. We had to then drive that elephant away uh, uh, and it was just sheer luck that nobody got injured that day or prior to that or even after that. It was just sheer luck. We are getting assistance from the local authorities with other hunters which are here, such as Mr. Corris. They assist with their rangers when these dangerous animals in the local communities, they send their guys, they, they chase away the animals. They have actually put a fence in the local area to protect the children from these animals. So they are playing a vital role in managing the human wildlife conflict. It's an electrified fence. Uh, we're all looking forward to the results of that as it's proved this year already. There has been a tremendous uh, reduction of, of wildlife in the area and this has been a great saviour for the, the people here. We, we just know that the, the people feel a lot safer now. So um, not only is it saving our lives due to controlling of wildlife, apart from that also we have some infrastructure developments uh, we have in this community. Uh, because of having our hunting operator. Every building at Gache Gache Secondary School uh, was built from having the safari operator both came direct from Mr. Corris because of what dividend. We also having youth games uh, as a way of controlling poaching because we used to hold them doing some sports using the money coming from the hunting operator. So if I want to mention one by one, I can spend the whole day explaining the good of having the safari operator in this community. On my right hand side, we've got little pens that are held for the, for the goats. And a few years ago, the lion learned how to actually open the doors. And the lioness would come in and knock the poles out until she could jump inside. That particular year we had over 120 goats that was killed in this area and it was basically by one part of lions just training them, training the youngsters on how, on how to kill. A disaster for a community where a goat is a livelihood and a goat is a protein for not one month but probably two months, never mind money that comes in. It was a problem, a big problem and eventually we had to remove one of the lionesses. So down here in Zimbabwe, we've got the Livingston Eland. In the Gachi here is probably one of the better areas to hunt, a nice Eland bull. When I first came here, there were very few. Eland, just on this last safari, we've seen herds of up to 30 Eland in a herd. We've seen lone bulls, old bulls, young bulls, which is great. I'm personally not a trophy hunter in, it's got to be the biggest animal and put it in a record book. No. The hunt is what's more important. The age, that should be the criteria when we're looking for an animal. We should be looking for age, not length. And that's what we try and do in this area now. We know that by doing that, we're gonna get the right animal.
somebody looking straight at us. He's now turned and walking. Straight. Straight. Cow in front of him. Yep, cow on his shoulder. He's ready. Uh, I've lost him. He's clear. By himself, By himself. Quartering away. Behind the cross, make it. trophy. He looked for horn mass, length, etc. But we weren't looking for a, a trophy. We were looking for the oldest bull we could find, which is exactly what we did. And for me, no hair on his neck. It was literally, it was black, dark blue, what we call a blue bull. His horns were stumpy. He had a big old mop on the front of his forehead. One of those amazing once in a lifetime animals. And nobody even had ever seen him before, which is awesome. It just shows that Anti-poaching is doing well here. When I first came to this area, I found the value of wildlife was very low. Poaching was rife. would go and find snare lines of two, three hundred snares. It was not unusual to take off a thousand snares in a season. Every one of those is a potential of killing an animal. With the awareness campaigns that were then pressed into the community, not only with the adults, but with the children as well, these numbers of animals started to increase as we managed to decrease the volume of snares. In total, we've put back into the community in excess of a million dollars, which wouldn't have been there had it not been for the hunting. We drop off in the region of between 10 and 15 tons of meat a year. Whenever I drive in the, in the area now, one of the first things they do is they don't say, well, Oh, well, well done for the, the school that's been built or the kindergarten that's just been erected. When are you bringing us some more meat? I also do guiding with groups of people out to do some photographing. Also helpful. And while it's great to have them on the ground, 10 photographic people will not even cover what one hunter can bring into an area. So your carbon footprint is actually a lot greater from all the tourists than what it is from the hunter. A hunter will come and spend $50,000, maybe even $100,000, or as little as $5,000. The photographic person might spend the $5,000 or as little as $1,000, so you need a, a tremendous amount of them in an area to, to cover what the hunter does. Yeah, there's a place for both. Honestly, believe there's a place for both. But this area to be a, the, the success it has, has come from nothing else but hunting. If we take a good example, after years of building this place up, two years ago, we were hit with the COVID problem that stopped all tourists worldwide. It took an operation that had been built for 20 odd years back on its knees because those foreign tourists weren't able to come in here with the real money. That money is vital to keep this operation going. I've got close on 30 people I employ full time. Now to suddenly have 30 people you're employing to keep them for a year with no income, had it not been for a few dollars that came out of some really generous hunters that sent money to us to try to keep boots on the ground, 
we would have had 28 years of hard work destroyed in one year. When I hear people say, no, all you, all you hunters do is just drive around and blaze away, and, uh, which is utter rubbish. You look at this safari, we've been hunting for 21 days now. We've shot seven animals. And of those seven animals, not a single young animal was taken. Every single animal we took on the safari was past its breeding and it was past its prime. Everybody thinks all we do is sit on the back of a truck and slay animals. I'm just like, nah, that's, that's not true. You need to actually come and see what we do. And everybody thinks that we don't put anything back into it. Well, I can tell you some of the poorest people in the world are bloody professional hunters because everything that they make, they put back into the areas and they look after. As I say, I've been here 29 years now and I've kept my staff. At times very difficult financially, very difficult. My staff that I've got here, have all been in the region of 20 years that they've been with me. We must be doing something right. How can you have the poverty and you sitting at your house knowing that that person is there and he hasn't got food for his child? The resources are not great, but we will take the resources and make sure that everybody gets a little bit. We have to look after this, not for ourselves. If we don't look after this, what's they going to be for my grandchildren? I go to bed at night many a time wondering, are they going to ever have the opportunity to see half of what I've seen? And if we don't hurry up and just everybody pull together, every single person from around the world, and not only for this area, but through any wilderness area in the world, we have to look after it for our children, their children. So we have to make sure we nurture and look after the land that we have got set aside for our wildlife. It comes at a cost. And that cost is not going to come just money falling off a tree. It's going to come from the hunter. And it's going to come from controlled hunting. Sadly, people look at hunting and they think, well, it's just, just going out and killing animals. It's, it's the ultimate conservation in the world. A true hunter will make sure that it's an old animal that he's taking off. It's not a young animal. The person that doesn't do that is not a true hunter. He's a poacher. He's raping the country. He's raping the wilderness. See no reason whatsoever for us to say that uh, hunting is uh, destroying animals. Actually, hunting is preserving the animals. If the hunters were not here, these mountains would be a flock with poachers from outside there. But the hunters are providing even security. They are providing guards in the forest who are guarding those animals. They are even teaching the community the importance of these animals. I've been in the industry a long time and I've seen ups and I've seen downs and the only thing that's gone in the positive side has been the hunting that's taken place. If we took the hunting out of this equation it will not take long. We are not talking of five years, we are talking of one or two years and the areas like this will be devastated and we will not bring it back. Please, we must keep the hunter on the ground. We haven't got a bait up yet so far, so... This is just walk and stalk so far. This is the first bait we've looked. If that's... Uh, if that's what we see in the first hour. I think that the man in the water right now has lost his mind. There is not, I, mm -mm. you see where the water is, where I, I am staying 10 feet away from it. I've seen what lives in this water. People spearfish in this water. 
You know, like swimming, diving down. No, mm -mm. not me.